Chapter Twenty One of Alcatraz by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle. He had time to burst from the hut and race across the clearing through the darkness, which would surely shelter him from the snapshot of even such an expert as Red Jim. But in mind and body, Hervey was too paralyzed by the appearance of his enemy to stir until he saw Paris slip from his horse, slumping to the earth after the fashion of a weary man, and drag off the saddle. He paid no attention to tethering his pony, but started towards the shack, down-headed, heavy of foot. Hervey had gained the door of the shack in the interim, and there he crouched at watch, terrified at the thought of staying till the other entered, still more terrified at the idea of bolting across the open clearing. He could see Paris clearly in outline, for just behind him there was a rift in the circle of trees which fenced the clearing, and Red Jim was thrown into somewhat bold relief against the blue-black of the night sky far beyond. He could even make out that a bandage circled the head of Paris, and with that sight a new thought leaped into the brain of the foreman. The bandage, the stumbling walk, the downward head, were all signs of a badly injured and exhausted man. Suppose he were to attack Paris single-handed and destroy him. The entire problem would be solved. The respect of his men, the deathless gratitude of Jordan, were in the grip of his hand. His fingers locked around the butt of his gun, and yet he hesitated to draw. One could never be sure. How fast, how lightning fast his mind plunged through thought after thought, image after flocking image, while Red Jim made the last dragging steps towards the door of the shack. If he drew, Paris, despite his bent head, might catch the glimmer of steel and draw and fire at the glance of the gun. There were tales of gun experts doing more remarkable feats. Wild Bill in his prime, from the corner of his eye, saw a man draw a white handkerchief thought it a gun, whirled on his heel, and killed a harmless stranger. He who stops to think can rarely act. It was true of Hervey. Then Paris, at the very door of the hut, dropped the flopping saddle to the ground, and the foreman saw that no holster swung at the hip of his man. Joy leaped in him. There was no thought for the cruel cowardice of his act, but only overmastering gratitude that the enemy should be thus delivered helpless into his hand. Through the split part of a second, that thrill passed, tingling through and through him. Then he shouted, Paris, and at the same instant whipped out a gun and fired point blank. A snake will rattle before it strikes, and a dog will snarl before it bares its teeth. Instinct forced Hervey to that exulting cry, and even as the gun came into his hand, he saw Paris spin sideways. He fired, and the figure at the door lunged down at him. The shoulder struck Hervey in the upturned face and smashed him backwards, so that his hand flew out to break the force of the fall, knocked on the floor, and the revolver shot from the unnerved fingers. If he had any hope that his bullet had gone home, and that this was the fall of a dying man, it was instantly removed. Lean arms, amazingly swift, amazingly strong, coiled round him. Hands gripped at him with a clutch so powerful that the fingers burned into his flesh. And most horrible of all, Red Jim fought in utter silence as a bull terrier fights when it goes for the throat. The impetus of that unexpected attack half stunned Lou Hervey. Then the spur of terror gave him hysterical strength. A hand caught at his throat and got a choking hold. He whirled his heavy body with all his might, tore loose, and broke to his feet. Staggering back to the wall, he saw Red Paris crouch in the door and then spring in again. Hervey struck out with all his might, but he felt the blow glance, and then the coiling arms were around him again. Once again, in the crashing fall to the floor, the hold of Paris was broken, 
and Hervey leaped away for the door, yelling, Paris, it's a mistake, for God's sakes. The cat-like body sprang out of the corner into which it had been flung by Hervey as the foreman rose from the floor. As well, attempt to elude a panther by flight. Lou whirled with a sobbing breath of despair and smashed out again with clubbed fist. But the lithe shadow swerved as a leaf whirls from a beating hand and again their bodies crashed together. But was it a dream that there was less power in the arms of Paris now? Had the foreman seen Red Jim lying prostrate and senseless after his battle with Alcatraz on that day, he would have understood this sudden failing of energy. But as it was, he dared not trust his senses. He only knew that it was possible to tear the twining grip away to spring back till he crashed against the side of the shanty, still pleading in a fear-maddened voice, Paris, do you hear? I didn't mean. As well, appeal to a thunderbolt. The shadowy form came again, but now, surely, it was less swift and resistless. He was able to leap from the path, but in dodging, his legs entangled in a chair, and he tumbled headlong. It was well for Hervey, then, that his panic was not blind. But with the surety that the end was come, he whirled to his knees with the chair, which had felled him, gripped in both hands, and straight at the lunging Paris he hurled it with all his strength. The missile went home with a crash, and Red Jim slumped into a formless shadow on the floor. Only now that a chance for flight was open to him did the strength of Hervey desert him. A nightmare weakness was in his knees, so that he could hardly reel to his feet, and he moved with outstretched hands toward the door until his toe clicked against his fallen revolver. He paused to scoop it up, and, turning back through the door, he realized suddenly that Red Jim had not moved. The body lay spilled out where it had fallen, strangely flat, strangely still. With stumbling fingers, the foreman lighted a match, and by that wobbling light he saw Paris lying on his face with his arms thrown out, as a man lies when he is knocked senseless, as a man lies when he is struck dead. Yet Hervey stood drinking in the sight until his match burned his fingers. The old nightmare fear descended upon him the moment the darkness closed about him again. He seemed to see the limp form collect itself and prepare to rise. But he fought this fancy away. He would stay and make light enough to examine the extent of his victory. He remembered having seen paper and wood lying beside the stove. Now he scooped it up, threw off the covers of the stove, and in a moment white smoke was pouring up from the paper, then flickering bursts of flame, every one of which made the body of Paris seem shuddering back to life. But presently the fire rose, and Hervey could clearly see the cabin, sadly wrecked by the struggle, and the figure of Paris still moveless. Even now he went with gingerly steps, the gun thrust out before him. It seemed a miracle that this tigerish fighter should have been suddenly reduced to the helplessness of a child. Holding the gun ready, he slipped his left hand under the fallen man, and after a moment, faintly but unmistakably, he felt the beating of the heart. Let it be ended, then. He pressed the muzzle of the revolver into the back of Paris, but his finger refused to tighten around the trigger. No, the powder burn would prove he had shot his man from behind, and that meant hanging. A tug of his left hand flopped the limp body over, but then his hands were more effectually tied than ever, for the face of the unconscious man worked strangely on him. It's him now, thought Hervey, or me later on. But still he could not shoot, helpless as a child. Why had that comparison entered his mind? He studied the features, very pale beneath the bloody bandage which Paris had improvised when he recovered from his battle with the stallion. He was very young, terribly young. Hervey was unnerved. But suppose he let Paris come back to his senses, wakened those insolent blue eyes, started that sharp tongue to life, then it would be a very much easier matter to shoot. 
So Lou went to the door, took the rope from Red Jim's saddle, and with it bound the arms of Paris to his side. Then he lifted the hanging body, how light a weight it was, and placed it in a chair, where it doubled over, limp as a loosely stuffed scarecrow. Hervey tossed more wood on the fire, and when he turned again, Paris was showing the first signs of returning consciousness, a twitching of his fingers. After that, his senses returned with astonishing speed. In the space of a moment or two, he had straightened in the chair, opened dead eyes, groaned faintly, and then tugged against his bonds. It seemed that that the biting of the rope into his arm muscles cleared his mind. All in an instant, he was staring straight into the eyes and into the thoughts of Hervey with full understanding. "'I see,' said Paris. It was the chair that turned the trick. You're lucky, Hervey. It seemed to Hervey a wonderful thing that the red-headed man could be so quiet about it, and the most wonderful of all, that Paris could look at anything in the world rather than the big colt which hung in the hand of the victor. And then, realizing that it was his own comparative cowardice that made this seem strange, the foreman gritted his teeth. Shame softens the heart sometimes, but more often it hardens the spirit. It hardened the conqueror against his victim now and made it possible for him to look down on Red Jim with a cruel satisfaction. Well, he said, and the volume of his voice added to his determination. Well, said Paris, as calm as ever, waiting for me to whine. Hervey blinked. Who licked you, he asked, forced to change his thoughts, who licked you before I got at you? Paris smiled, and there was something about the smile that made Hervey flush to the roots of his gray hair. Alcatraz had the first inning, said Paris. He cleaned me up, and that, Hervey, was tolerably lucky for you. Was it, sneered the victor? You'd have done me up quick, maybe, if Alcatraz hadn't wore you out. He waited hungrily for a reply, that might give him some basis on which to act, for, after all, it was not going to be easy to fire point-blank into those steady, steady eyes. And more than all, he hungered to see some wavering of courage, some blenching from the thing to come. "'Done you up?' echoed Red Jim, and he ran his glance slowly, thoughtfully, over the body of the foreman. "'I'd have busted you in two, Hervey.' A little chilly shiver ran through Hervey, but he managed to shrug the feeling away, the feeling that someone was standing behind him, listening, and looking into his shameful soul. But no one could be near. It would be simple, perfectly simple. What person in the world could doubt his story of how he met Paris at the shack and warned him again to leave the Valley of the Eagles, and of how Paris went for the gun but was beaten in fair fight. Who could doubt it? An immense sense of security settled around him. Well, he said, second guessing is easy even for a fool. Right, nodded Red Jim. I should have knifed you when I had you down. If you'd had a knife, said Hervey. Look at my belt, Lou. There it was, the stout handle of a hunting knife, the same chill swept through Hervey a second time, and for a moment he wavered in his determination. Then, with all his heart, he envied that indefinable thing in the eyes of Paris, the thing which he hated all his life. Some horses had it, creatures with high heads, and always he had made it a point to take the proud gleam out. A horse is made for work, not foolishness, he used to say. Here it was, looking out at him from the eyes of his victim. He hated it. He feared and envied it. And from the very bottom of his heart, he yearned to destroy it before he destroyed Paris. You know, he said with sudden savagery, what's coming? I'm a pretty good guesser, nodded Red Jim. When a fellow tries to shoot me in the dark, then slugs me with a chair and ties me up, I generally make it out that he figures on murder, Hervey. He gave just the slightest emphasis to the important word. And yet something in Hervey grew tense. Murder it was, 
and of the most dastardly order, no matter how he tried to excuse it by protesting to himself his devotion to Oliver Jordan. The lies we tell to our own souls about ourselves are the most damning ones, and they are also the easiest. But Hervey found himself so cornered that he dare not think about his act. He stopped thinking, therefore, and began to shout. This is logical and human, as every woman knows who has found an irate husband in the wrong. Hervey began to hate, with redoubled intensity, the man he was about to destroy. "'You come here and try to play the cock of the walk,' cried the foreman. "'It don't work. You try to face me out before all my men. You threaten me. You show off your gunfighting, damn you, and then you call it murder when I beat you fair and square, and—' He found it impossible to continue. The prisoner was actually smiling. "'Hound dogs always hunt in the dark,' said Red Jim. A quiver of fear ran through Hervey. Indeed, he was haunted by chilly uneasiness all the time. In vain he assured himself with reason that his victim was utterly helpless. A ghostly dread remained in the back of his mind that through some mysterious agency the red-headed man would be liberated, and then... Hervey shuddered in vital earnest. What would happen to a crow that dared trap an eagle? I'm due back at the ranch, said Hervey, to tell him how you jumped me here while I was waiting here, quiet, to warn you again to get out of the Valley of the Eagles peaceable. Before I go, Paris, is there anything you want done, any message you want to leave behind you? And he set his teeth when he saw that Paris did not blench. He was perfectly quiet. Nearness to death sometimes acts in this manner. It reduces men to the unaffected simplicity of children. No message, thanks, said Red Jim. Nobody to leave them to, and nothing to leave but a horse that somebody else will ride and a gun that somebody else will shoot. And the girl, said Lou Hervey. And a thrill of consummate satisfaction passed through him, for Red Paris had plainly been startled out of his calm. A girl? You know what I mean, Marianne Jordan. He smiled knowingly. Well, said Paris, breathing hard. Why, you fool, cried the foreman. Don't you know she's gone plumb wild about you? Didn't she come begging me to get you out of trouble? You lie, burst out Paris. But by his roving glance, by the sudden outpouring of sweat which gleamed on his forehead, Hervey knew that he had shaken his man to the soul. By playing carefully on this string, might not he reduce even this carefree fighter to trembling love of life. Might he not make Red Paris cringe? All cowards feel that their own vices exist in others. Hervey, in his entire life, had dreaded nothing saving Red Jim, and now he felt that he had found the thing which would make life too dear to Paris to be given up with a smile. Begging? I'll tell a man she did, nodded Hervey. It's because she's plumb generous she thought that might turn you. Why, she don't hardly know me. Don't she? sneered Hervey. You don't figure her right. She's one of the hit-or-miss kind. She hated me the minute she laid eyes on me, hated me for nothing, and you knocked her off her feet the first shot. That's all there is to it. She'd give the Valley of the Eagles for a smile from you. He saw the glance of Paris wonder in the thin distance and soften. Then the eye of Red Jim returned to his tormentor desperately. The blow had told better than Hervey could have hoped. And me a plain tramp, a loafer, me, said Paris to himself. He added suddenly, Hervey, let's talk man to man. Go on, said the foreman, and set his teeth to keep his exaltation from showing. Five minutes more, he felt, and Paris would be begging like a coward for his life. End of chapter 21